Carl and Mindy are our faves. They are behind the 1500days.com blog, and we have an absolute blast every time we hang out with them. We'll talk in the beginning of the episode about the philosophy of fire and the slight workaholic tendencies that Carl and I share. But bear with us, because by the end, we get into nuggets of wisdom about trailer park real estate investing, leveraging a 401k for real estate. Gwen and I both learned a lot in that conversation and a few other goodies that you're going to love. Let's go. Welcome to Fire Drill Podcast, where side hustles, savings, and creativity lead to financial independence. With your hosts, Gwen from Fiery Millennials and Jay from Millennial Boss. Welcome to another episode of the Fire Drill Podcast. We are super stoked to have a wonderfully amazing couple on today. We have Mr. and Mrs. 1500. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And by the way, you can call us Carl and Mindy. When people say Mr. 1500, I feel kind of like a James Bond villain, but like a, a subpar one. So I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I so subpar villain. So Carl and Mindy are cool. Unless you really like Mr. and Mrs. 1500. That's You can call me Mrs. 1500. I like to be a James Bond villain. This is getting complicated. Sorry. <laughs> you know, out of the two of you, I think Mindy would probably be the better James Bond villain, to be honest. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I don't know if oh, that's a compliment or an insult. It's a compliment. <laughs> it's definitely a compliment because Mindy's got the whole scary mom thing going on. Yes, I do. Okay, and um, I can't forget that we have our wonderful co-host Jay on as well. Hello. Hi, Jay. Hi. So, Carl, Mindy, tell us the 90-second blurb about your life. 90 seconds? Okay. 90 uh, seconds. Time starts now. Uh, Go. First came the dinosaurs, then they died and turned to oil, and then the Arabs came and bought Mercedes. <laughs> You're stealing that. No, that's, that's from the movie Airplane. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm really dating myself there if you've seen the movie Airplane. Um, I'm not quite that old. Let's see here. So I was born, uh, I saw at a young age that my parents weren't super good with money, as a lot of parents are, and it put this tear in me. I, I was so afraid of being broke because my, uh, my parents would make some crazy decisions, and even at a young age, I can tell they weren't good. Hey, kids, we bought a timeshare. I'm like, oh, geez. I'm like 10, and I know that's not a good idea. <laughs> so so anyway, as soon as I knew I had to go to college because I knew I could make more money then, so I did that. I figured out what kind of job would pay me well. I got that, and uh, I hoarded money. I, I never had, I never knew what early retirement was until I found Mr. Money Mustache very recently, not until I, I was 37. But we had been savers, so we had like uh, – one, the day I found Mr. Money Mustache, we had almost $600,000 saved up, and we had $150,000 in home equity. So making the leap from that to early retirement wasn't a big deal. And I've shot off my mouth. Let's see if uh, the villain, Mrs. 1500, has anything to say about her childhood. That was way too long. That was so not 90 seconds. I'm sorry. <laughs> he doesn't even follow rules. Okay, so we're frugal and we flip houses. And I have like 87 seconds left. <laughs> Succinct to the point. I love it. <laughs> Carl, you and I have that in common, that whole financial scarcity mindset in the past. I grew up poor as well with a single mom trying to raise three kids by herself on minimum wage. And I swore to myself after my mom said that I couldn't get light up shoes when I was five, that I never wanted to be poor. I wanted to be able to buy whatever I needed and not have to say no to myself. Yeah, it's amazing how these little things in childhood can affect you. And one thought I've had about myself was, what kind of person would I have been if I'd grown up different? Would I still be the same way? And the, the answer I've come to is, I don't have a clue. I mean, I like to think I would have still been frugal and been like this, but I have no idea. You know, different things shape different people. So who knows? Totally true. Jay, how'd you grow up? Hmm. I grew up with two parents. and. I did not get light-up shoes, and I did not get a Barbie car, but I think I did pretty well. I do remember financial insecurity. We had those conversations a lot, and I know that I did not have as much money as other kids in my town. So I think that had a, its effects on me. Um, oh, in high school, when I played field hockey, I was voted – I had the most likely to be on Pimp Your Ride – do you remember that exhibit show? Because my car was so bad. Yeah. Like people ask my friends, is she going to be offended by this? And my friend was like, no, she'll think it's funny, which I did think it was funny because I like that show. <laughs> but uh, okay. So that paints a picture of my childhood. So I just gave a bunch of millennial pop culture references and hopefully you guys can put me somewhere in the 
the economic stratosphere with that. Does anyone have Pimp Your Portfolio um, reserved? I think we should go try to get that URL right now. Pimp Your Portfolio. And we totally should. I'm take. down. That would be an that excellent show. Awesome. Let's do it. I won third place in worst car in high school behind Todd Knezovich, who had painted on the side of his crappy car, like Motley Crue and Metallica. I think he painted it with a broom. Um, <laughs> and I don't remember who was in first place, but I was in third place and I was pretty proud of that. It would me and my 83 vet, my, uh, sh vet. Your sh vet. Sh vet. I didn't yeah, know anyone Camry. <laughs> it was fun. I graduated in 2009. Sorry. And, um, I had a 2002 Dodge neon that strained to go up any sort of mild incline. It was awful. <laughs> it was all downhill. Literally. Good times. Good times. Yeah. Oh, I tried to go downhill as much as possible to save that engine. <laughs> so I know that growing up poor inspired me to work hard. Carl, I I assume that it had the same impact on you. Yeah, uh, very hard. But it was all to one means it was to get money. So I did good in school because I thought good grades would give me a good job. I always worked really hard at work. I volunteered to stay late. I, I remember at work, this is a crazy story. So we had a really good situation. This is later in my career. We were allowed to telecommute. Um, and my work didn't care if we went on vacation, we could go to Florida and just work from there. So, and we were paid well. So one day we're all standing around and there's this big production issue. And the boss goes to the DBA. She's like, uh, Hey Mike, uh, can you stay late? And Mike's like, no, I've got to go to bowling league. I'm like, wow, there's a production problem. And you're like that. I'm like, geez, I was like terrified for him. So then six months later, we had to get rid of some team members. And guess who like who got let go? It was him. And he had his condo in Florida. And he uh, after that, he had a terrible commute. And he could no longer work from his condo. He had to go into work every day. So it's just something I would never think about just because of that terror money. I always wanted to be the best person. My greatest fear was always getting canned for my job. And it turned out I went 20 years. And I never, yeah, I never lost a job in my entire life. So. Uh, which I don't know what that says for me. The other thing is, I was thinking about this earlier this year. I never took more than a week off since I was 14. And not all that was full-time. Obviously, I was in high school and then college. But in college, I had a job the whole time. In high school, I had a job after I was 14. and could work at McDonald's. And uh, my first time having more than a week off didn't come till after I left work at the age of 43. So how pathetic is that? Go financial insecurity. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's just a lot of working. And I get grumpy if I work like 42 hours in a week. Do you think that that focus on work manifested itself in a healthy or unhealthy way? Like unhealthy. that doesn't sound, yeah, it doesn't sound very healthy. Unhealthy. I'm going to answer this one for him. He can't stop. And that's great when you have a project that you want to finish up, but it's really, really bad when you are trying to relax and he can't relax. Um, when was the last time you read a book for pleasure? Um, like just, just a garbage book, you know, not about, he's currently reading Ruby on Rails books. And for a while, that's all he was reading was things that would further his education as opposed to just entertain him. And he finally read somewhere that, you know, you're, when your mind is going nonstop, uh, you can't sleep well. And he was having trouble sleeping. So he started reading like a Stephen King book or something. And then all of a sudden he was able to to fall asleep because he would let his mind like relax and read this book. But I mean, since he's been retired, what, since last April? What have you read, like four books that weren't educational? Yeah, I'm starting to pick it up. Uh, my current one is a Richard Feynman book, but uh, what was your original? Oh yeah, it did manifest itself in a good way because uh, yeah, I was thinking I probably worked 80 hours a week for two decades. I would work at least 40 or 50 hours a week in my normal job, sometimes 80 hours a week at that, on rare occasions, rare stretches. But then I, we'd come home and we flipped houses. So uh, we'd put in like nights and weekends, we'd be up till 10 or 11 at night, wake up at six and start all over again. It was uh, it was not the right way to do it. I would not recommend this for anyone. I, I know, Jay, you had a comment and uh, when you inter interviewed Physician on Fire, where you were kind of like that too, you were working towards a big number, but I, I think you've self-corrected and realized that wasn't a smart way to go since then. Correct me if I got that wrong. No, you're right. I mean, truthfully, 
I have 99 problems and this is definitely one of them. I mean, I am a workaholic. I'm a workaholic. And it's funny uh, partnering with Gwen on this podcast because we both approach life a little bit differently right now. and A lot differently. A lot differently. <laughs> like sometimes <laughs> um, Gwen, when we sign on at night, she'll be like, oh yeah, it was a great afternoon. The sunlight was hitting my porch and I was outside reading a book and it was so relaxing. And I am listening to her like, what are you talking about? I've never done that in my life. I don't understand. What do you mean? You weren't listening to a podcast? You weren't reading? You weren't trying to do something with the blog or whatever? So I I definitely can work on it. But I know this about myself. So I picked a job this year that didn't require as many off hours as my previous job. I mean, it's still a very hard time intensive job and I definitely work over 40 hours a week, but I'm not on call at night. So I have time to do things like this. So that, that has helped a lot. Um, but I am working ironically. Yeah. Ironically enough, I am the one that's on call. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Aren't you leaving your job? I am. I am leaving. Part of the reason that I am leaving is because I have to be on call and I have to carry around a cell phone and I have to bring my laptop with me if I'm on call. And it's just a pain. Like, you know, when you're picking out some paint in Home Depot and you're in paint mode and then all of a sudden you get a call and you're like, oh, yeah, totally. We'll help you break into your laptop over the phone in Home Depot. Like, eh, I'm not about that life. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. You're better adjusted. Yeah. The thing is, so I want to make two other real quick points. If I could do it over again. I would have relaxed at the very end of my work just for the last uh, four or five months. I went part time and that was great. I highly recommend everyone do that because uh, that gives you time to explore yourself and figure out exactly how you're going to spend those hours when you're not working. Or, or maybe another option if that isn't a, uh, an option for you is to take a sabbatical, see what it's going to be like. And that hasn't been an issue at all for me. I wish I didn't have to sleep because I've got so many things I, I, I want to do. I have no problem filling up every minute I have. But the other point I was going to make is uh, I thought as soon as I left, I'm all of a sudden going to be happier and like rainbows are going to come out and unicorns are going to be jumping over my head. And the thing that happened is everything is kind of the exact same. I had a little bit less stress because my job could be stressful, although it wasn't at the end, but I wasn't any happier. And it was at that time I learned after like uh, 44 years, 43 years of life at that time, 43 years of life that Happiness comes mostly comes from the inside. You gotta figure that out yourself. It's not influenced as much from external factors as I would have guessed. So I would make a point really quick. Did you hear him say, Oh, I could easily fill up every minute of every day? Yeah, I definitely don't get that life because I cannot go like that. It's like you guys are the energizer bunny or something. You know, you just keep going. There's no off switch. And I like get tired of my productivity goes down and the quality of my work goes down and I like need to recharge. I don't understand this whole like going all the time thing. Well, that's a really interesting concept. You need to recharge, huh? <laughs> what, what does recharge mean? Do you want to look that up in the dictionary? I drink beer sometimes. When I saw Jay earlier this year, I had a beer with Jay or maybe two. I wasn't driving. <laughs> yes, very good. I would yep. also like to point out that the four of us consumed a number of alcoholic beverages at our party at FinCon. Mm, that was a good and interesting night. I don't remember that at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you might have overindulged just a little bit too much. I don't remember that either. Boy, I, was <laughs> next day. I, I usually go to bed at nine o'clock at night or even earlier if I can get to it. But that night I wasn't in bed till like four in the morning. So it was a... Didn't we have a podcast the next day too? Yeah. <laughs> my voice was gone. I didn't get out of bed till two in the two in the afternoon or the podcast is at three or something like that. And my voice came back like half an hour beforehand. I'm sorry, we're getting off base here. This community definitely has a shared love of craft beer. It's great. It's delicious. So speaking of vacation time, Carl, earlier when we were talking, you said you one time took off a week of vacation just to remodel your house. And I can totally relate to that because I am thinking about taking time on vacation to renovate my house in Colorado before I sell it. And I also regularly take time off to go to conferences and to kind of further my entrepreneurial stuff. And now that I think about it, that's probably bad. I probably should be using that for pure vacation. Would you recommend that people not do that? <laughs> if you have to take vacation time to remodel, to change out your toilets or to uh, retail your kitchen, you're probably doing something wrong in life. <laughs> Maybe you're working too much. <laughs> it depends on your situation. Yeah. So 
we did uh we tore out our whole kitchen we tore out all the tile tore off all the cabinets redid gas lines redid electricity and redid some of the walls in a week and it was just crazy well it was almost a week my goal was to do it in five days and uh was that when we flew my sister out here? Yeah, we flew a babysitter out here. Then I just worked like 16 hours a day for five or six days straight. Yeah, we even flew a babysitter. That's how intense we were. She's uh, my sister and the girl's favorite person on the planet. So it was worth it. I, I don't like projects I drag on. I like to hit them very, very hard and get them behind me. But yeah, back to your original point, Ju- yeah, back to your original point, Jay. I think if you're taking two weeks off out of your precious vacation time to do things like that, you're probably living life a little bit too intense. Yeah, it's a tough balance because a lot of us who are trying to reach that number, working as hard as we can to get there, it will speed it up. But at the same time, there's a lifestyle cost to that. And maybe chilling out a little bit and taking 10% longer may be more advantageous in the long run. Yes, do it that way. The thing is, I was thinking about, I know you're into fitness, and I was thinking about something today for most of those those two decades that I worked hard, I hardly exercised. Like the thing that's most important was the first thing to drop off my radar, which is terrible. You should be taking care of your heart and eating right and all that. And none of those things happened because we were just on this death march to this big number. And it was uh, it was ridiculous in retrospect. I'm trying to correct that now. I walk like uh, – what I, I usually put in 120,000 steps a week about. Um, I'm running 10 or 15 miles a week now, so I'm trying to make up, but you can only make up for so much. Yeah, I'm reading this book, The Lucky Years, and it's written by some famous doctor. And every night I'll read it before I go to bed, and it's freaking me out, honestly, because it's telling you all about like your hormonal changes, and there's such a thing as your biological age. So even though I'm about to be 29, I really could be 38 in my biological age. The concept of it is it's actually um, – at first, it was a little bit freaky. Now it's motivating me to do better. But that's a concept that I think a lot of people need to be aware of. The trade-offs that you're making on your health to get to FI faster are serious. Yeah. And another another thing is probably along those same lines is a lot of the damage you do to your body is, is cumulative. It's not like you could just stop eating garbage when you're 55 and your heart plaque will go away. It's been – your arterial plaque will go away. It's been accumulating that whole time. You can't – you can only self. You can only correct so much at a later age. You got to be thinking about it the whole time. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that I don't get anywhere near 120,000 steps uh, a week. So that's something that I should definitely work on. You will soon when you don't have a job. But I will soon because I will be moving to Minneapolis and I intend to ride my bike everywhere. And I'm joining a swim team, so I'm gonna get in like tons of exercise. I'm stoked. Yeah, I was going to say you might not be riding your bike much when it's uh, in January in Minneapolis and it's 20 below zero. Although if you do, I have a whole new level of admiration for you. Yeah, I don't want to be a downer, but those winters are pretty brutal. You would be surprised at the number of people I see riding their bikes so far this year. Like, it's crazy. There's bicycle- there are bicyclists, uh, people who are riding bikes everywhere, <laughs> and it has been flipping cold. So, like, major props to them. Yeah, are you going to get one of those bikes with those four-inch wide tires? Oh, the fat bikes or the fat yeah. tires or whatever they call them? The super fat. Um, the snow tires. Yeah, probably not. However, Minneapolis has a very very robust network of bike lanes. They plow those first, and then they plow the roads. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's so all. it's actually like really easy to get around on your bike in the winter. Hopefully, I just don't die in the alley, which doesn't seem to be plowed at all. So it's definitely a little on the icy side, which is interesting. Yeah, at least you'll freeze to death pretty quick. Yeah, there's a bright side to every cloud. So that's a great transition. (laughs) Okay, so we talked a little bit about what you would change in your march to Phi. But let's talk about how you got there in the first place. And to tell everyone what we're going to talk about, We're going to talk about solo 401ks, individual stocks, real estate. We're going to hit all these topics in the next section. So let's start it off with the self-directed solo 401k. I recently opened up a solo 401k, and I did not look into the option of doing a self-directed one. So can you tell us everything about that that we need to know? Yeah, well, a solo 401k is pretty awesome in itself. I know you've discussed the benefits of that before, how your company, your corporation can match 25% of your wages and... You could do all kinds of great things with that, but 
a self-directed solo 401k takes it up another step in that if you like things like real estate and other investments, you can diversify into that. So if you have a solo 401k, you might just be investing with Vanguard or Fidelity, your index fund, which is a great strategy, by the way. But if you like to do more obscure things like real estate, and we do things like private loans, uh, syndication deals, we just bought a trailer park, and we do all three of those through the self-directed 401k. And it's nice because it's all pre-tax. Those investments are more income generating as opposed to an index fund, which might have a little bit of dividend every year. But these have a lot of income, so it's there on that tax sheltered account. So we're not paying taxes every time we get a rent payment from the trailer park or a uh, excuse me or a quarterly payment from our syndication deal. There are some interesting rules around it. For example, if you buy a rental house, you can't maintain it yourself and things like that. But I don't want to talk too much about that because I'm not an accountant. But you have to be aware of those rules. But if, if you're okay with it, you can invest in a lot of other crazy things that wouldn't be available to you through a solo 401k, and it's not that difficult to set up. And I want to point out that the self-directed solo 401k is only available to people who are self-employed. You have to have self-employment income in order to be able to create one. You have to continually have a company that is generating income in order to keep the program active. So it isn't just for anybody. There's, I think the solo part is the self-employed part. The self-directed, you can do a self-directed IRA or a self-directed 401k when you no longer work for the company that was that you had put the money into originally. Like you have a 401k with your current company, Gwen, when you leave that current company, you can then turn it into a self-directed IRA or a self-directed 401k. Um, Yeah. And you guys have mentioned that on the blog previously, and I looked into it. And I don't know if I'm comfortable using my safety blanket today. Because to me, that that money is a hedge against the future. So I don't want to end up like my mom, you know, single and and broke and trying to raise kids. So that's kind of like my my insurance. You know, like I'll never be broke, but so I, I don't know if I want to use that to invest in and potentially have it go wrong. And That's a good point. We are slightly older than you and at a different point in our lives. So our numbers are different and we don't use every bit of our solo 401k money for this. We've got some in stocks. We have a very diversified portfolio in general And we also do a lot of research on our uh, investments and we don't just give them to anybody. One of the things that we're doing is a private loan uh, or a series of private loans. And we loan to pretty much one person or we lend to pretty much one person. And he's about as sure a bet as you could get. So, you know, it's uh, we could get higher interest rates if we went to different people and we could get more money. But I'd rather trade the stability of the the certain the sure bet guy with the uh, quick money from the other people, because I don't really want to own these properties. And when we make our loans, we we lend in a first position lien, which means that if they stop paying us, we can foreclose on their property and take ownership of it. I don't want to own properties all over the country like that. <laughs> so. That's not my goal. It's not to foreclose on the property. It's to get the money back that I lent. These are more advanced strategies. If uh, And these took a lot of research. I hate calling them passive because we've got years of experience that led us to invest in these. I think if you're not willing to do the research or if you don't want to, VTS SAX is a fine solution too. So we will link to all of these posts. And we have mentioned VTSAX. I mean, everyone mentions it in FI, but we haven't talked about any of this stuff on the podcast. So just so I can conceptually understand this, you have a self-directed solo 401k. Who's your provider for that? It is called Sense Financial. They're the people who set it up. So if you want to do this, you have to have someone form a trust for you and do a little bit of paperwork and you have to pay for that too. So would highly recommend them. Okay. And it typically costs what, like $2,000 for a trust, a thousand. I don't even know how much does it cost. The initial setup was $800, and then it's $200 a year after that. Okay. And the self-directed part means that you literally just go on the UI and pull out the money? Yeah, it's interesting. So people send us checks, like when we get a rent payment for a private loan or a payment from a syndication deal, we get a check made out to the trust. Um, I deposit it with my phone into a bank account that's devoted to the trust. 
And from the bank account, I can direct my money anywhere I want, except back to me, at least until I'm 59 and a half. So I can put it into another real estate deal. I could put it into another syndication deal. I could buy property with it, like what we did with the trailer park. So you control it all, which I kind of like. It's interesting. You even have a checkbook for it as well. So you're the custodian for it. Uh, IRA is a little bit different. I think you have to have a separate person be a custodian. But with a 401k, you can do it all by yourself. And you have to put the money back or something by a certain time? How does that piece work? Uh, no. So when I make a loan out, uh, let's say I loaned Jay $50,000 and Jay pays my trust, let's call it uh, 1500 trust. Jay writes out checks to 1500 trust, not to Mindy, to 1500 trust. I send that to my bank account and they just deposit it. So I give you a big bunch of money and then you pay it back little bit by little bit over whatever time we determine. And that's just considered an investment. Like I bought Apple stock with this money and then Apple pays me a dividend. I don't know. Does Apple pay a dividend right now? Yes, they do. So Apple pays me a little bit by little bit. It's just sitting there, you know, waiting for you to pay me back. And then when you do pay off the loan, I go and find Gwen and I give her money and she starts paying me back little bit by little bit. So as long as the money, the check isn't made out to me personally, it's just like a dividend. Okay. And then for tax purposes, they just give you a document at the end of the year that explains where the money went and all that. Yeah, they, they issue that, but it's not really a concern for us since it's in the 401k. IRAs have slightly different rules. And for that, you do have to worry about some of the taxes. But for the 401k, I don't think there's any taxes we need to worry about. No, it's just a gain. Like Apple, you bought an Apple at 100 and now it's worth 150. Well, yay, you just made 50 bucks. It's however much money we make is just a gain and you don't have to do any creative monkey business, I don't think. Yeah. I don't do the taxes. I will say get a get an accountant because yeah, it's, they're worth their money. It's just like a 401k though. You get taxed at the end when you start drawing from it. I think this is better than an IRA though. And Gwen, obviously you aren't comfortable rolling over your employer's 401k into this. But if you were to open this for some of your side businesses, I mean, I don't know what the requirements are, but as long as you're cash flow positive, you could have a solo 401k. You could get a self-directed solo 401k if the cost makes sense, depending on how much money you're making. And in that case, you can put 25% of your income on your business as well as hit that 18.5 employee contribution. Yeah, this is where it gets really fun. For round numbers, let's use, let's say you make $100,000 as your salary from this income generating self-employment. So the company can take 25% of your salary, so $25,000, and put it into your 401k. You can put an additional eighteen five this year, eighteen thousand five hundred, into your four hundred one k, and that's all tax free, tax deferred. It's all pre tax. Pre tax. I'm sorry, I said the wrong word. And, and the thing is, too, what uh, what people should know is we have a Vanguard account tied to it too. So when there's extra change rolling around in there that we don't have a better use for at the time, it goes into a Vanguard index fund, just like a normal four hundred one k. So yeah, nice. And the IRA, you're limited on your contributions. You can only put 5500 Yep. Yeah, I'm well aware of all the benefits and everything. I just <laughs> don't know if I want to risk my biggest chunk of net worth right now. Right, rolling it over. Yeah. yeah. Here's my advice to you, Gwen. You are the one who has to be able to sleep with your decision. So if it doesn't make you comfortable, then don't do it right now. You have – how old are you? 30? <laughs> 27. 27? So you've got some time. And you can yeah. just do a normal solo 401k. So there is no additional risk there either. So it's all benefits if you do that. And it's a lot cheaper to do. You can set that up in an hour or two. I, I think, Jay, that's what, exactly what you have, right? That's what I did. And I guess it doesn't make sense for me to pay extra per year and for the initial one-time cost for me to do the self-directed right now because my side income is not making enough money. But I guess I would say this for anyone out there who's like, oh, well, I don't have a business, so this doesn't apply to me. You could have a business in two seconds and take advantage of this. I mean, I my Etsy shop was built over a weekend and a lot of coffee. Um, so I, I would say <laughs> it, this could help more people than I think think this could help them. Yes, you do need to generate income. And once you stop generating income, I mean, even if you have like, loss years, that's that's not necessarily not generating income. There's a lot of ins and outs to it. So you definitely want to talk to somebody who knows more about it than we do. Dimitri from Sense Financial, 
is really, really fantastic. And he will explain absolutely everything to you as many times as he needs to for you to understand. It's kind of, it gets kind of complicated and, you know, out in the weeds, but yeah, if you're generating income or you have a business that, you know, is an actual business, this is a great tool to further yourself on the FI path. Okay, cool. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about with you guys, you mentioned trailer parks and we actually had someone who lives in a trailer park in episode six on And we learned some intricacies with financing for trailers and paying for the land and who owns the land and all that stuff. So I'm just curious, why trailer parks? Because they print money. They can be... Cha-ching, cha-ching, (laughs) cha-ching. They can be good investments. Our goal, this isn't how it is right now, but our goal is to only own the land because... once you just own the land, you're responsible for plowing the uh, plowing the place, um, it, the, some of the landscape upkeep. But if the furnace goes out or water pipes freeze in the trailer, it has nothing to do with you. So you eliminate the hassles that a traditional landlord might experience. Um, you just own the land and collect rent on the land. Now, it's not going to be as much as if you were renting the trailers out, but it becomes a lot more passive once you can do that. Uh, the other thing is that it's all about location. If you can find a uh, a trailer park in the right location, you can do really well. We just read something. I think there's 5% less trailer parks every year. The The land becomes too valuable, so they get shut down. So there's fewer and fewer of them. And at the same time, they provide a cheap living. And the, the one that we happen to purchase is right in a very right next to a very expensive town. So I think the average house price is something like $295,000. But hey... You can live a mile outside of town and live on a piece of land for $300 a month or whatever the rent happens to be on that particular lot. So they can, uh, yeah, they can provide living for people and low hassle um, passive income for you. Almost passive. It's not passive. Do you have to pay for upkeep on any community facilities? Our property does not have a community facility. I think there's like some grass that we have to mow. But and we have to plow the the streets. The is it a street? The road. Yeah. Um, the road that goes through the trailer park. We have to plow that. That's not city property. But once we sell all the units that we currently own, uh, all the mobile homes. Uh, so about half of them are owned by their owners, and would they just pay us lot rent? And the other half are owned by us or vacant, and we need to. Uh, we want to sell those. So. After we sell all of those, there's really almost no upkeep, but we're just collecting a lot of lot rent. And, and I had this great idea because our house now is worth a ridiculous amount of money and I'm not comfortable with it. So we have like $450,000 in equity in our house, which I don't like. So my suggestion to Mindy, Mrs. 1500 here, was we sell our house and move into one of these trailers. I don't want to live in Maine. And then, yeah, super cheap living, $3,600 a year. It's incredible. You can go live there. (laughs) Maine is so awesome, though. Not as awesome as Colorado, but it's pretty nice. Maine is beautiful in the summer. You can go live with Jay in Maine. I'm not going (laughs) to live in Maine. I would just like to point out that living in a trailer park, it has a ton of stigma to it, but it's actually not that bad. When I got kicked out of my family's house like a month and a half before I left for college when I was 18, I moved in with my friend in a trailer park and it wasn't that bad. I mean, I had a place to sleep at night and it was just like a normal house on the inside, except with, you know, wheels. We talked about this in episode six, but I met a friend when I lived in Silicon Valley that lived in a trailer and I went and saw her trailer and it was so nice. It was way nicer than the apartment that I was living in. It was way cheaper than the apartment I was living in, in the same exact town. She said though, that there was an income limit. You had to make over a hundred K to live in that trailer or to buy into that trailer park which I thought was interesting. Wow, wow. That's, that is interesting. If I could do it over again, I would definitely pursue this as an option. Um, my first property was a condo. She's coming around. I'm not going to live in a trailer park in Maine. <laughs> Everyone from Maine is going to be sending you pictures. It's awesome. It's, uh, Maine is beautiful, but Maine is like 700 below zero right now. And it lasts like nine months out of the year. I used to live in Wisconsin too. The winters are just forever. And Colorado, it's like the best kept secret. They have all this really great weather that nobody knows about. Today was 60. So you're saying that Colorado is terrible and nobody should move there, right? Colorado is 
terrible and nobody should move here. It was 60 above today. Can you believe that? <laughs> I keep oh, telling everyone cool. about it, how Colorado is the best state ever. I love it. I miss it a lot. But where I live right now is really cool too. It is. Okay. So how do you even get into a trailer park? I mean, how do you buy into this? You have to buy in cash or there are weird financing things from your end? So we got really lucky. We have, it's a three-way partnership with a guy who lives in Maine named Ryan, a guy who lives in Washington state named Brandon and the two of us, but we only count as like one third of that. Ryan lives in the next town over and he knew that Brandon had been looking for a trailer park and he he came across this. He had bought a property from the guy who owned the trailer park. And then the guy's like, yeah, I'm going to get rid of these two trailer parks I had. And Ryan said, well, I'm not interested in the one, but I'm really interested in the other one. And we went back and forth. I think that it's owner financing, right? The guy owns the, so the guy who owned it was, was 70, he was 78 old. and he'd owned it forever. He is holding the note on the loan. So the guy we got it from is holding the note. So we just pay him every month. It's like he's the bank. It was because Ryan found it. Ryan brought it to us. He knew Brandon was looking and Brandon knew that we had this extra cash lying about. So how does the owner financing thing work? Um, So basically the man who used to own it is now the bank. When you buy a property from somebody else, the bank lends you the money to buy it. The other person relinquishes their ownership and gives you a deed and then you're paying it down and then they they release the lien. The bank releases the lien on the property after you've paid it off. So we have, it's all like written with lawyers and everything. He's the bank and we make him monthly payments. And then he, when we finish paying him off in 20 years, he will release the lien and we own it free and clear. I looked into seller financing for a property that I would look to buy this fall And what he basically offered me was a balloon loan. But you guys, it sounds like you guys have an actual 20-year note, not a balloon loan that's amortized to 20 years, right? It is a sweet deal. Yeah, we have a 20-year mortgage on the property. And the first year is interest only. So we can kind of, there's some properties, some units that aren't quite up to par. So we need to spend some money to get them fixed up. But yeah, it's a 20-year mortgage that we will pay off in hopefully 20 years. That is definitely a sweetheart deal. It it really was a sweetheart deal. Can you share numbers? And if you're not comfortable with sharing your numbers, can you give us some type of a ballpark? Because I have no idea how much it even costs to purchase a trailer park. So the trailer park has 46 pads or lots. So you could technically fit 46 trailer homes in there. I think there are four empty lots and 12 that are not rented out because they're in a state of disrepair. What do we pay? 1.1, 1.05, 1.1, yeah. 1.05, like. Yeah, the original price is 1.1, but then it got reduced by, I think, about $75,000 because some issues were found with some of the trailers before we closed on it. One of the key things that I liked about it was we had the land appraised. So I think the final purchase price was like 1026000 but we had the land appraised by an independent appraiser before we ever bought it, and they said the land was worth a $1 million dollars. So that was comforting to know that the trailers aren't worth that much. And with this particular deal, there was a lot of deferred maintenance on it. In other words, it was in crap condition. So we bought that going into it, but that's also kind of nice because we could see the potential in it. And it might be six months to a year before we see the first check from it. But once it's all fixed up and once we've managed it to how it should be managed, it should do really well for us. And what, what are you expecting in terms of return? We think uh, once after a year, once it's all stabilized, we'll make about 15% a year back on our money. So what's that? About five years to get our, our original down payment back, and then it's all profit after that. And then if we still have it in 20 years, obviously that'll go up a lot more because uh, the thing will be paid off at that time. Right. Well done. So both Gwen and I only own properties with ourselves. I mean, technically I own my house with my husband. But I've never gone in on a property with friends or uh, fellow investors before. What is your relationship while you're doing this? Like, Do you divide it evenly? How do you determine who does more work and how that plays into it? How does that work? Uh, This one is pretty location-based as far as who does all the work. There are three partners. Ryan lives in Maine and the rest of us don't. So Ryan does all the work. But we structured it in a way where he is compensated for the work that he does. 
so like after expenses, all the profit is divvied up based on the amount of money we each put into it. We didn't all put in 33%. So it's just however much we put in is, is however much we get back after the expenses. But we also, and this I think is a really important point, we also wrote this all out before we bought the property. So when you're going into a property with a friend or a, a business partner, everybody's all happy and, and friendly. But if there's some issue down the road, maybe Gwen remembers it differently than Jay does. And having it all written out means that there is no misremembering. It's this is how it is because we wrote it down. Sounds like a prenup. It's kind of like a prenup. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. The other thing I'd say is in any of these deals, and I would say the same thing for the other two kind of deals we do, the private lending and the syndication deals, You probably the most important thing is you really have to know who you're working with and their track record. What I always tell people is if one of these deals goes south and the whole thing explodes and we lose all our money, I like to say that I wouldn't be mad at the person because I know I trust them enough that I know that they've done all all they could and, and something went wrong that was out of their control. Maybe there was some ec- economic catastrophe or whatever, but that's how much I trust the people. There's probably a, there's very, 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 very few people in the world that I would hand over a large sum of money to, but the ones I would, that's exactly my mindset. If they lose it all, I, I'm not going to be mad at them because I know they did all they could to salvage the deal. So is your role, your role is more as investor. So you don't not that you don't care, but in filling some of the vacant units and the maintenance and stuff, that's on Ryan to do all that work. Yep. He's yes. doing it 100%. And the way the self-directed solo 401k is, we couldn't do that even if we wanted to. We would have to hire that out. That's one of those rules for that type of account. Oh, okay. Interesting. Interesting to know. Okay. So that makes sense. So if he, I guess you need to be a chill person and not chase the person who's responsible for doing that work too. Uh, yes. And, you know, it really helps that it is in Maine. Maine right. is not next door. Maine is like a nine hour plane ride from here. So it helps that it's over there. I don't feel a need to go check on him. He gives us regular updates and we just closed on January 2nd. So it's still pretty new, but he gives us regular updates. Hey, here's the units that we own that need work. Here's I'm, I'm working on placing a tenant in this one. And I'm, you know, I just got kind of bad news that the furnace needs to be replaced in that unit. And, you know, but he's giving us regular updates and we knew going in that it wasn't, you know, perfect. Well, thank you for giving us that information. I think the last thing that we want to talk to you guys about in this FI community, everyone is in love with VTSAX and its equivalents. But I know that you two are individual stock investors too. So can you tell us a little bit about the strategy there? Yeah, I want to give you a little bit of background. So this is kind of embarrassing, and this will tell you what kind of geek I am. So everyone has these points that they remember in history, like uh, like I remember when the space shuttle blew up. Both I was of them. Say that. Yeah, <laughs> and you, you remember when certain people were shot or when certain things, certain bad things happened. One of those memories in my life is the day I first discovered Google. I remember I was at work and uh, I, I was trying to, I was a programmer, by the way, and I'm trying to solve some problem. And this guy next to me goes, oh, just Google. I'm like, what did you just say? He's like, Google. I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? He's like, oh, it's this new website, this search engine thing. So he showed it to me. I go in there and I typed in my question and uh, poof, there was my answer. Right then, my life as a programmer changed because instead of having to dig through these ridiculous 500-page books, I could be lazy and just punch into Google. I'm like, wow, this is awesome. So then I learned that Google is going to IPO is in August of 2004. I'm like, I have to get in on that. So I bought a bunch of Google stock at that time. Another thing that happened along those same lines is I remember there are all these rumors that Apple is going to release a phone in there. I was all this hype. And I remember watching uh, the Steve Jobs conference. I think it was at Macworld in January of 2007. So when I saw him on stage holding the phone, I'm like, wow, that thing's going to be huge. I have to buy the Apple stock. And and I bought that too. And uh, what I really did that was lucky is though holding on to these, most of these stocks through the whole time. I don't recommend this strategy because I attribute more of this to luck than anything else. And it still could go up in flames for me. I still own these. So maybe Google will go back down to its uh, IPO price before I sell it. Now we're index fund investors. Uh, all new, almost all new money goes to that when we don't have a good real estate deal going on. But I did get lucky with stocks. I think we have uh, 
We had four 10 baggers. Google's a 20 bagger. We had Apple. We had Tesla, which we bought in the 20s back in 2012. And I can't remember what the other one was. What's I know there's 10 bag? What does that even mean, 10 bagger? It means like uh, Google what it came out at $85 a share, and it means it's worth 10 times that. And now it's actually worth 20 times because oh. they had a, they had a two for one split. So I think it's around 1000 a share, but they had a split. So accounting for that. Cool. So I would just like to point out that Stack Overflow saved my life in college. <laughs> Stack Overflow is awesome. I would like to I, point out that I don't know what that means. It's a website that people like post all their problems and experienced programmers respond and like help them troubleshoot. So basically any error that I got, I just Googled it and they were like, oh yeah, this is what you did. You, you misplaced your third semicolon, you know, and you need to move it one space over and everything will work. And it did. <laughs> yep. I just want to point out my first search engine was Metacrawler. I don't even know what that is. I think it was it was something with like it sounded like a spider. I remember that in the nineties. And I made a website about beanie babies. And, oh, it, <laughs> and I found it in the search engine. I was like really proud of myself. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, I don't think the thing with stocks, especially technology stocks, is you don't know when they're going to when their empire is going to end. Every empire comes to an end. And for tech stocks, it's much faster. You think in 2007, who was on top of the world? Nokia is a hardware manufacturer and uh, Rim, BlackBerry, whatever they were, they were the dominant phone. And then I remember Steve Ballmer was CEO of Microsoft when the iPhone came out. And he laughed at it. He's like, there's some famous quote, which I can't remember. He's like, this isn't going to go anywhere. And turns out he went to a lot of places and put Nokia and BlackBerry under. So... But someone will disrupt Apple. Someone will probably di disrupt Google and Amazon. And y you never know what the landscape is going to look like in 10 years. And that's what makes stock picking so different in general. I think I just read this today. Like a huge percentage of all the companies that ever existed are no longer around. So that's why index fund is so enticing and such the right direction for most people. My retirement funds are in index funds. But in my brokerage account, I do like to pick tech stocks for buy and hold. And oh, do you have I, tips? I mean, I don't have tips necessarily, but as someone who worked in Silicon Valley, I mean, I, I'm part of that culture. Like, I, I can't imagine not choosing tech or putting or betting in tech. So for me, I have these five that I'm very confident in, and I, I continue to, if I have extra money, I put it in there. Now, we are not financial advisors. Anyone listening should totally not do this at all. But for me, that's my approach. And I just see the innovation, the way that these companies run. And as someone who's worked at some of these big companies, like I, I have my faith in the people that work there too. I mean, there's a huge overlap with the financial independence community, but there's a lot of people who they're willing to run into walls every day for these companies. So that's my opinion on it. Yeah. Betting on innovation, but no one should listen to me. Jay, don't be so, so bullish on tech. You're going to make him want to get back into individual stocks. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I still like some of them. I mean, uh, uh, it's very interesting to see where the world is going. Like autonomous car software, that's the biggest software problem there is now. The company that gets that right is going to make a whole lot of money from it. And uh, yeah, I think I know who's in the lead, but I won't say it because I don't want to give anyone wrong ideas. Yes, we are definitely, um, okay, we're going down a bad path for fire. But, you know, it's good to present okay. all different points of view in this in this world. <laughs> Yeah, all our money goes to index funds. Um, uh, real estate too. Yeah, yeah, real estate. But when it goes from the markets now, it goes back into index funds. So yeah, we're not buying new individual stocks. We're actually looking to get rid of some of them. See the problem. So with an individual stock, when it goes up, all of a sudden your you know ten thousand dollar investment is a third of your entire portfolio, and you want to dance with the one who brought you, but you don't want to have them leave you at the dance so it's difficult <laughs> like when do you cut and run i went to a mr money mustache meetup this past weekend and one of the guys there was telling he was giving advice to everyone he's someone who did achieve fi and he said that the make or break moments in your financial journey are when you're transferring large amounts of assets in moving asset classes. And he was like, be very careful. So uh, technically, you guys, if you choose to sell all of the individual stocks you have and move it into something else, that could be considerably impacting your your net worth, depending on how the, that moves. It's kind of scary. 
You're scaring me now. I'm, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it was interesting. It was interesting. I mean, his point was, I think, a little bit more like dollar cost average. Don't just like move stuff quickly like that. But, you know. Yeah, that's actually what we're doing. We're trying to avoid capital gains. And if you're not over like, uh, I think it's $72,000 in taxable income, you can solve to that in your capital gains and not pay capital gains taxes. I realize that made absolutely no sense. But there's a way to sell stocks and not pay capital gains if your income is lower, which it is now that I am no longer working. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're selling things off, but it'll still probably take us at least a decade to move it all. Is that the word um, tax gain harvesting or something? Is that it? That's it. That's it. That is it. Bingo. Okay. We will link to something in the show notes if you haven't heard of it so you can dig into that further. It's great. I I didn't know about it actually until like two weeks ago, but it's, uh, it's wonderful, especially to do early on in retirement before you have to take 401k distributions, but after you're done working, so your taxable income is lower. Cool. All right. So we have gotten so much information from you two. We had some fun at the beginning and now we have the hard facts at the end. We are going to close it out with two more questions. But before that, I want to give you the floor. Is there anything that you haven't mentioned that you think an audience pursuing financial independence needs to know? I would say the main thing that bothers me about the financial independence movement or maybe the early retirement movement is um, some people have this drive. I just saw it on a Facebook group the other day, a Choose FI Facebook group. Some people have this huge drive to quit work, and that's not really what it should be about. It should be about to give you options. Once you have all the money, you might decide that you don't want to leave work. Um, Mindy here took a job after we became financially independent. Because she likes the work so much. And I like it too because she gets us health care. So <laughs> the, uh, you never know. Work, meaningful work is the meaning of a meaningful life. I said meaning way too many times in that sentence. But, yeah, um, that was terrible. Yeah, it, that was a terrible <laughs> sentence. Uh, work means something different to everyone. You might not be working because of money anymore. But you, you never know. The work you do after you become financially independent and leave your job might make money anyway. But my, now I'm getting off base. Your main goal shouldn't be to quit work. It should be to give you options to do whatever you feel like doing once you get to that point. Yeah, I started out at the I hate my job and I hate working and I want to go back to the lifestyle I had in college. So I was like hyper aggressive about saving and I was just like, I am i don't want to work anymore. I want to quit. And now I have I've said farewell to early retirement. I will I don't think that I will ever be retired early. Instead, I will be financially independent for my whole life, and I have that flexibility and that freedom to do whatever I want. Yeah, and on your own terms, too, there's there's something else that's very important. Like, if I could have worked and stayed in my job and only done it for, like, when my kids are in school, for example, and if I would have, could have summers off and their time off, I probably, I may have kept doing it. Maybe not, but... To be able to do things on on your own terms is hugely powerful. I think it was Mindy's co-host who said at FinCon, imagine the power and the impact we could make on the world if money was out of the equation and we could focus on driving meaning and change. I thought that was pretty profound. Yeah, the the whole point of financial independence is to to have enough money where you can make your decisions without regard, without thinking about money. That's what it is to me. Exactly. Nice. All right. So I think we're ready for the final two. Gwen. We are ready for the final two. Mindy, Carl, if people would like to get in touch with you, how can they do so? We are all over the internet. (laughs) On Twitter, I am at Mrs. 1500, MRS1500. I think I'm, am I that on Facebook? I might not be on Facebook. I have no idea. Or you can email (laughs) me, Mrs. 1500 at 1500days.com. Where are you? And I'm um, at Mr. 1500 or Mr. 1500 at 1500 days.com. And uh, we've kind of gone public. Mindy is also Mindy at Bigger Pocket. So if you're into real estate, um, you can find her there as well. Excellent. All right. Jay, you want to head up the last question? Sure. Okay. And we're going to ask both of you this individually. So first, let's start with Mindy. If you could live out your wildest dream, your secret, kind of embarrassing, crazy, whatever, wildest dream what would it be? I'm doing it right now. I get to talk about real estate all day, every day at work. I love my job. I have never loved a job more. I am living the dream. I would like a little bit more hours in the day. Uh, I'll keep it as PG as possible, maybe PG-13. I I would buy an island in a tropical place, um, 
where I could wear the most minimal amount of clothes every day, but still a high speed internet connection. So I could still write code because I enjoy doing that. That's part of what I do now. I just don't get paid for it. So yeah, I'd wear the minimal amount of clothes, learn how to surf. And, uh, I would wear some clothes. I don't want to get sunburned in the wrong places. Um, <laughs> so I'd surf and then I'd write code like a night or when the waves weren't coming in or whatever. I think that's what I would do so a, with my lovely wife and children, of course. So a nudist island for programming and surfing. Not nudist. Not totally nude. I don't want to see it. Almost a, nudist. Yeah, Almost. Rub, I think it would be classified as clothing optional. Well, see if you rub sub sunscreen on the wrong places, you're oh, going to get in trouble if there's other people there. FICO, financial <laughs> independence, clothing optional. Nice. Uh, shorts optional. Shorts optional. Shorts and shorts. All right. Well, let's wrap this up before we put too many thoughts into people's imaginations out there. Thank you both for coming on. We had a lot of fun and we learned a lot. And thanks for your tips. We have not talked about any of these topics in the podcast yet. So much appreciated. Oh, well, thank you for having us on. I had a good time. Yeah, if you want to throw this whole thing in the trash, I don't blame you too. Oh, but stop. Thank, thank, you. <laughs> thank you for having us. Hey, everyone. Today's sponsor is Olivia from the Birds of a Fire blog. She writes about financial independence and hacking luxuries for way less. She's a 25-year-old woman who lives in New York City, is a spreadsheet and programming nerd, and saves a whopping 70% of her income. She believes everyone should be able to retire early, so she created a free 20,000-plus word financial independence two-week email course that comes with a super in-depth spreadsheet so you can save more, invest better, and retire sooner. You can find her and the course at birdsofafire.com slash fire drill. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Go to our website, firedrillpodcast.com to continue the discussion and get the link to our private Facebook group. If you like us, leave us a review on iTunes. If you're like me, you have no idea how to do that. So in the podcast app or in iTunes, search for Fire Drill Podcast, find it, click the reviews tab and write something to make my mother proud of me. We read every single review and want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts for making this podcast possible. 